Father, it is a great privilege for us again to come together and to, and to sing to you. And these words of these songs are so precious to our hearts because they are reflective of the truth that we hold dear in our hearts that we have trusted in, and that is the marvelous grace that you have extended to us in your dear Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin, in whom we have all of the promises as yes and amen, in whom we have adoption, in whom we have life, and we do so long to finally uh, be in that full experience of life that is our hope, that the return of Christ and ultimately, and you're bringing about the new heavens and the new earth. And that's what our hearts long for. The resurrection, the new heavens and the new earth. And a life with you that will never be disturbed or shaken, but only grow and grow in its wonder and joys and glories for all eternity. May you encourage us to that end, even this morning. And it's in the name of Jesus, who accomplished all things for us, that we pray. Amen. I'll open up, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 5, and actually that's the, this will be the last time that we're opening up to 1 Peter chapter 5 as we're going to finish the epistle this morning, uh, completing our look at verses 12 through 14, particularly looking at verses 13 through 14 this morning. These are the closing words of the Apostle Peter. These are the final words as he ends his letter to this suffering church, to this church whom he is writing to encourage with hope and hope that is grounded in the salvation that Christ has accomplished for us and the certainty of a salvation that he will bring with him at his return. And with him and in all of his glory and the glory of the Father and the glory of all of the angels that we will see, we will rejoice, we will at that time Time, receive our resurrected bodies and as Paul said to the Thessalonians forever be with the Lord and these are the truths that are so precious to us and the truths that are precious to God's people throughout the ages throughout the history of the church this is what has sustained God's people in all of the difficulties and the trials and the uncertainties of life one example of this comes from Susanna Wesley. Y'all right remember Susanna Wesley? She was the mar mother of uh, John and Charles Wesley. She was also the mother of 15 other children. I think she had 17 uh, in total, somewhere around there. So we have some moms that need to, uh, need to get busy, actually. No, 17 would be hard. But nonetheless, she had uh, 17 children, most famously John and Charles Wesley. She died on July 23rd, 1742. She was 73 years old at her death, so she lived a rather full life. Her father was one of the ministers or served as a minister in England when many of the pastors were ejected because of the act of uniformity, referring there to the mandate that the churches all be uniform in their expression of worship in the Book of Common Prayer. But nonetheless, her father was one of the men who was rejected, and so she certainly knew to some level a, a suffering for the faith, a kind of persecution that comes from standing on the Word of God. She's buried in London's Bunhill Cemetery, and on her gravestone are these words. Ensure and certain hope to rise and claim her mansion in the skies. A Christian here, her flesh laid down, the cross exchanging for a crown. That's a great epitaph, one that many of us would want to put on our own gravestone to have remembered for all who would pass by. But it's a beautiful statement, particularly because it bears marks to two truths, and these two truths connect us with Peter's own encouragement in his epistle. One is this, that death is not the end. It's not the end for anyone in terms of existence, but it's especially not the end for a Christian in terms of life and in terms of living. Christians have been promised and granted a part in the kingdom of Christ that is to come, a salvation that we know now only in part, but one day we will know in a fullness that we can only imagine. We get taste and we get glimpses of it here, but it will only be known in its fullest expression at the return of Christ. And so we're reminded that death is not an end, and even until the return of Christ, there is an entrance into his presence, and so Paul could say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and it's very much better, he said to the Philippians, to be with the Lord than it is to remain here on earth. 
And so we're reminded, one, that death is not the end. It's merely the portal, the entryway, the doorway into the full glories that our hearts long for. That's why we live in hope. But number two, it expresses this, a theology of that hope. A theology of that hope. The theology of salvation, the great doctrines of the Christian faith. It is the doctrines of the Christian faith and the teaching of Scripture on which the church is built and on which the church stands and on which the church and the people of God have been encouraged throughout the ages. It's what we build our lives on is truth. Truth that God has told us. Truth that we have confidence in. Truth that is verified ultimately in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but as well in the preservation of his word and the work that he does through his word, even as we stand here this morning as a testimony of it. It's the truths of our salvation on which we stand, on which we build our lives, and which are reflected in our mutual encouragement and fellowship with one another. What should mark Christian fellowship, as we've noted many times before, Christian fellowship has content. It's not merely that the people who get together are Christians. It is that what defines that getting together and the fellowship that we share as believers is that it is built on the reality of the gospel, and that should be reflected in all of our times of true fellowship. That it has content, it has meaning, it has a particular flavor and characteristic, and all of that has to do with our trust in Christ and our trust in the promises of his word. So it's not surprising then as we come to the close of Peter's letter here, as with all the New Testament letters, that the theology that undergirds the content of the letter is also the theology that is reflected in his personal relationships and here in his personal ending to this letter, which is very intimate and speaks of the kind of relationships that he shares. It's essentially uh, a personal note to the working out of the theology that he just laid down for us and the exhortations and the instructions that he has given to us throughout the rest of the epistle. And so there are perhaps many things that could be brought out, but there are three particular doctrines that are reflected in the Peter's epistles, and last time we also went to his, to his second epistle, uh, second Peter, that are an encouragement and shape the kind of fellowship and the kind of hope that should be reflected in our own fellowship. And they are these, the doctrine of scripture, the doctrines of salvation, and the doctrine of the church. We noted last time, very briefly, the doctrine of Scripture. Uh, this morning, we'll end by looking at the doctrines of salvation and the doctrine of the church. Read with me, if you will, however, these last words, beginning in verse 12 of 1 Peter 5, down to verse 14. Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to you all who are in Christ. And these are really precious closing words that show the heart of the Apostle Peter, but also that reflect the reality of the gospel. Now we noted last time the doctrine of Scripture, which is here more implicit. And it's implicit in the very fact that included in the Word of God, the eternal Word of God, the canon of Scripture, are what are very common words, very common greetings, and very common salutations. Very common expressions of relationship within the church. And about, regarding the doctrine of inspiration, then we looked briefly at Peter's own explanation of that in the second epistle, in which Scripture was given to to us, sourced, originating in the work of God, in the mind of God, in the work of God, but worked out through the agency of man. And we see the very human aspect of Scripture here, and that it comes through the personalities and the personhood in every dynamic, every part of that, every part, what, everything that that means on the pages of Scripture. And so we see here very much the person of Peter. But the person of Peter being expressed in a way that God wanted it recorded for us for all eternity and for the ages of the church to be an encouragement and to be reflected upon and to be read and to be thought about. And so we see here then the doctrine of Scripture. But as well, the doctrines of salvation. The doctrines of salvation. And again, these are the, the things, these are the truths that 
weave its way through and end all of our fellowship. So we can even think of how do we fellowship with one another. If somebody were to observe our time together with other Christians, what would mark it as distinct? What would mark it as distinctly Christian apart from how we might get together with anyone else and how we might spend time together with anyone else? Well, we see one example here in the Apostle Peter that his fellowship here through the written word is what reflects the very doctrines that are dear to him and to those to whom he was writing. And certainly the doctrine of salvation stands at the front. Look what he says in verse 13. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings. And here, then, is a mention of the doctrine of election. And really this verse forms what in, in terms of literary terms is sometimes called an inclusio. Some of y'all, we talk about that on our Thursday night study, how you'll see that in scripture. And an inclusio is really a, a literary unit where it has two bookends. It has a truth at the front and the back that are the same or complement one another. And everything in between is really then a reflection and an explanation of those truths. So Peter began his letter with the reminder that they were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ. In other words, I'm writing to a chosen people. I'm writing to an elect group. I'm writing to those who have experienced God's salvation by His own sovereign purposes before the foundation of the world. And then there's a reflection of what that salvation is, how that salvation is to be worked out in the lives of his people, forms the content then of the letter of 1 Peter. And here he ends on that same note, that she who is in Babylon chosen together with you. Now that statement, chose he, she who is in Babylon, we'll come back to that later. But here I'll simply note that this is best understood as a reference to the church. A reference to the church. And as such, it is then a reminder of the common bond that we together, as the people of God, with all of the people of God, share in the experience of the eternal grace of God. There's a reminder as well that though God calls and elects individual, he elects and calls us to a relationship with Christ in a common salvation. And I know that we mention this a lot, or I mention this a lot, and we covered this even recently in verses 9 and 10 when he says, your brethren who are suffering around the world. In other words, he brings those in as what we share, not merely as our own suffering or those who were, to whom he was writing, but also that that suffering is something experienced by all those who belong to Christ all around the globe. In their case, those who were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. In other words, you're not alone. You are a part of a body. And as a part of a body, you are sharing in the experiences of that body, not only in your local context, but in the global context, particularly the church still here on earth. So often in American culture, we treat salvation as if our individual trust in Christ were the sum total of his saving purposes. As if the terminus or the end or the completion of God's saving purposes were merely for us as an individual to be saved and to live our lives in that salvation. So one example of that, uh, we were talking about this, it came up as conversation on Thursday night uh, before the study. This is just one example. There's many examples that, that we know of in our life of independent Christians who don't really ever attach themselves to any particular body or any, under any particular leadership. But it came up in the question of Kanye West, as that's obviously been a topic for many of whether his salvation is real, is it not, and how should the church respond? Well, we should respond, first of all, as a side note here, by praying for him as we would for anybody. As we would for anybody who makes that profession, praying that it would be real, praying that God would protect them, praying that God would show that salvation if it is genuine to be genuine and to shine forth as gold. But another comment was made because of an article written about it is that what would be wise for Kanye at this point who's making this new profession is rather than going around and holding these Sunday services uh, to take some time to be under the leadership of God's church and to learn and to grow. And then from that place of maturity go out and be therefore an evangelist in the way that he's doing it. 
But the problem, or one of the issues that we would want to hopefully see corrected eventually, is that the idea of these Sunday services merely from someone who's popular and can gather a crowd together is really showing a misunderstanding of the church. It's ecclesiology that is the issue. The church is not merely where a bunch of Christians happen to be together. The church is a body of believers called together under the kind of structure and worship and organization that God himself has established in his word. That is, the church is the gathered people under the leadership of an elder or elders who has the offices of deacons, who has, is the context of regular meeting with a regular body in a regular location where the life of Christ is to be lived out in a, lo in a local congregation. That is the church. That is what we celebrate as we gather this morning and even as we take the Lord's Supper. But the point simply here is this, that the church consists, or when one is saved, you are saved into a body of believers. You're saved into not merely uh, the same salvation that you get to experience on your, on your own, in your own way, in your own place, but that you are to experience together with God's people. That's the mere point here. Paul says it this way in Romans 12, that we are members of one another, that we're members of one another. And so for Paul or for Peter to say this here, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, is a reflection of this common salvation that we share as the church. And here one congregation sending greetings to another congregation identified by what? That we are elect with you. We are elect and chosen with you. We share in this salvation and we share in this common bond. Now, a lot of times when people hear election, uh, people think of exclusion. Exclusion, those who are kept out of the King of God. So they, we hear election, and some would think, well, that's, that means that God keeps a lot of people away who would have come into the kingdom, and he doesn't allow them in the kingdom because he has other people that he wanted in the kingdom. And that, of course, has nothing to do with the biblical presentation of election, which, by the way, is God's own word. It's not a theological word. It is. But it wasn't made up by theologians. It was presented to us in Scripture itself. And here, those who are chosen. But in fact, to hear that word and to think of exclusion is exactly the opposite of how a Christian should understand our election. The overwhelming sense that should come over a believer when we think of election or being chosen together with those who are Christians is that of inclusion. Inclusion. Inclusion into the people of God because of the love of God. It should stir up in us a profound sense of the goodness of God that he has extended to us through Christ to be included in his kingdom, included in the salvation that is in Christ, included in his inheritance, included in the common sharing of his life that we share together with all who are the elect and all who are the chosen. So this is, again, then a reminder that by saying this chosen church who is in another location but is sending you as greetings, but they share in this common salvation is to show and is a sweet reminder that we share in all of our struggles and joys as the body of Christ. We share in those things together. So we should foster that understanding when we hear of the church abroad, the church suffering, what the church goes through in other places, and not feel distant from that, we immediately feel a connection, a bond, a sharing, a sharing together with those whom we have never met, whom we may never, will never meet this side of heaven, but a sharing with them in their common experience of salvation, whether it be in times of blessing or whether it be in times of persecution. I'd already mentioned this. I'll just mention it again in verse 9. He puts it in this way. We resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences or suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. In other words, you're not alone. You are a part of a body. You are share in the same wonders of grace. You have been included in the people of God. And so whatever troubles this world may bring, we have this promise together. Uh, how Paul ended his section there in the Romans 8, talking about this hope and this future hope that believers have in the Spirit. He says, Nothing can separate us from the love of God, 
which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's another part of the doctrine of salvation that's reflected here. Not merely the common experience of election, of redemption, of being chosen in Christ, but also with that is the great truth of adoption. The great truth of adoption. Look at what he says again. There at the beginning, actually in verse 12, he says, through Sylvanus, our faithful brother. Our faithful brother. And the term brother is used in a variety of ways in a variety of contexts. Sometimes you can have any kind of association or group, any kind of human association where you refer to yourself as brother. You can have police unions where it's your brother, your union brother. You can have those who have common hobbies or share a variety of interests together and they might refer to one another as brother. Uh, some of you might refer to just friends in general as brother in the workplace or whatever. In a more theological sense, liberal theology has taught that there's a universal fatherhood of God and so we are all spiritual brothers in the same sense because we all have the same spiritual father, which is God the Father. So there is, you probably heard of this, the brotherhood of man. We do share the common experience of salvation for certain, but it, that's not true. God is not a spiritual father of all of us equally, so we certainly wouldn't use that broadly or blandly in that way. And as a matter of fact, Jesus said to the apostate leaders, you're well familiar, you are of your father, the devil. And the first letter of John makes clear that there are two spiritual families. Those who are of the spiritual family of the devil, that's the seed of the devil. And those who are of the spiritual family of Christ ultimately fulfilled the fulfillment of the promise, the seed of the woman. It's identifying two spiritual families, two spiritual realities that exist in the world. There's no middle ground. So when we as Christians use the term brother or sister in a Christian context, it is a testimony every time we say that to participation in the eternal work of God in redemption and making us his children, adopting us into the family of God making rebels children and making rebels sons and daughters in the son. This is what he says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. He says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us, there's election, it's reflecting Peter's words, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him in love, there's election to, connected to the motivation of the eternal love of God. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace. When we say brother and sister, when we greet one another in those ways, we are reflecting theological realities. We are saying that we are together the family of God. We have been adopted in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. We have, by his own work in Christ, been brought into the most intimate relationship with him and with one another, the relationship of a family. One said this, the notion that we are children of God, his own sons and daughters, lies at the heart of all Christian theology and is the mainspring of all Christian living. It's a precious truth. A precious truth. It speaks of the rich, intimate fellowship, a sharing in the love of the Trinity by extension through the Son. It speaks of being brought into this familial love within the Godhead itself, whereas the Father extends his love to the Son through all those he has given to the Son in redemption. This eternal love of the Father is extended through the Son by the Spirit out to us who are the elect who are the adopted, who are the family of God, who are sons and daughters, who can say to one another, my brother, my sister in the Lord, my brother in Christ. This is a tremendous truth reflected in those words. Now Paul speaks of adoption within a legal framework. John speaks of becoming children of God through the metaphor of birth. But both John and Paul, though coming at it from different ways, are reflecting to us the reality, that overarching reality and truth of sonship, that we are sons and daughters in Christ the Son. We are participating in the love of God 
through Christ. That's why Jesus could say, after the resurrection, I go to my God and your God, my Father and your Father. We share in something intimately that he brought to us, particularly through the incarnation and through his death and through his resurrection. That means together then, as the church, when we say brother and sister, being a part of the family of God, it means that every believer together knows that deep inner experience of what Paul says is the reflection of this adoption is that we cry out, Abba, Father. In intimate terms, we relate to God through Christ. That means this, by implication and by reality, that as the church of God, as the family of God, as the one with the same spirit producing that same rich fellowship with the Father through the Son, by the Spirit, that we together share in the richest spiritual realities of salvation together. Believers experience inner, inner realities, inner feelings, inner hopes, inner joys, inner frustrations, inner struggles that nobody else on the planet can experience. Only a Christian can go to another Christian and understand the spiritual struggles that are a result of our salvation. Only a Christian can relate to another Christian in those spiritual realities and encourage one another in them. Only believers only believers share that together. It's not merely a common interest that brings Christians together. It is, as Paul put it, that we are one body and one spirit, that we have one Lord and one faith and one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is, who is over all and through all and in all. And we share that. When he says, our faithful brother, he's acknowledging our faithful brother who with you, with me, and with us is in the family of God, who has been chosen, who has been adopted, who has been redeemed, who has been called into this rich fellowship together with us, and who partakes in the same rich promises. It shows then the reality of regeneration. Again, Peter has already mentioned this in his brief letter. Right at the beginning, he reminds us that we have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He tells us that we have been born again in verse 23 through the living and abiding word of God. This is at the heart of it. We are those who have experienced life. And at the center of this life... Reflecting Jesus' own statement this morning we read is that there is a love among the brethren, a unique love that is a reflection of the reality of spiritual life, true spiritual life, the reality of regeneration. He says in verse 22 of 1, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. That's why he repeatedly says throughout his epistle, he refers to them as beloved, as the beloved. You are the beloved ones. You are the ones loved of Christ, and in this case, the ones loved of me who is in Christ with you. In the Psalms, David would reflect that in the psalmist in ways. He says, the saints on earth in whom is all of his delight, the people of God, He said, I think it's in Psalm 121, how pleasant and how precious and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity, those who are a part of the covenant people of God. And in fact, this is a very expression of the reality of experiencing that new life. Sometimes uh, someone can say, I am a Christian, eh, but I don't really go to church. I don't really go to church. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I kind of worship God in my own way. You know, me and God, we got, we got something going. I like to go out in the wilderness. I like to listen to certain Christian songs. It makes me feel really weepy. And, and that's how I commune with God, or I, I commune with God in my own kind of way. I don't really need the church. I don't really need, that's just an institution anyway. That's just kind of this thing invented by man. It's religion. I don't need that religion. I've got my own kind of spirituality. That does not come from the Spirit of God. That does not come from the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God does not produce that kind of thinking in a person. 
comes from another spirit. The Spirit of God, when one is saved, is saved into a body and into a family. And the heart of the expression of that is that there is a love for the others who are in that family of God. The very expression of participating in that life is that you want to be with the people of God. That you experience this affection and this connection with Christians that you do not experience with anyone else. So John says, for example, in his letters, that the one who says he's in the light and doesn't love his brother, there's no truth in him. There's no truth in him. How are you going to work out the one another's of Scripture in serving and loving the brethren if you're not among the people of God? How can you receive the encouragement and sit under the truth of God and experience and live that out together if you don't love the people of God and are with them? How can you be corrected by your brothers and sisters if we are not among the people of God? How in the world can we say, I love my family, but I never want to be with them? Oh, yeah, I'm in that family. Oh, yeah, I love them. But, oh, yeah, no, I don't want to sit with them at dinner. I don't want to be in a conversation with them. I don't want to go anywhere with them. Everything I want to do is to isolate myself from them and kind of do my own thing. Oh, but I love them. They're my family. You'd say that's, there's a disconnect there. And so it is spiritually. So when we say brother and we talk about regeneration and we talk about the fruit and the, the, the fruit of salvation, it is, the center of that is love for the brethren. Love for the brethren. Which means at the very least, at the very base level, at the very basic level, is that we want to be with the people of God. Wherever they are, we want to be with them. And so this is expressed here. Our faithful brother, why? Because we're adopted into the family of God. The church chosen, why? Because we are elected together. We together share in the life of God, the hope of God, the hope in Christ. And here, and we're going to come back to this later, I'm going to mention it just here though. It's the same love that he says in verse 14 that is to mark our greetings with one another with the kiss of love. We'll come back to this later, but... But let me just use this to make the point here. In the ancient world and the wider culture to which he writes, this would have been common enough among family and friends. And you can see that in other cultures uh, even now. The idea of hugging and embracing or kisses are particularly Middle Eastern culture and other cultures as well. But you can see that kind of expression. It's a, it's a normal kind of expression. However, what is striking in Peter's instructions here, and it's also given in other letters, is that the church is comprised of those who would never have had such a bond or that kind of intimate or affectionate relationship outside of the bond that's shared in Christ. Outside of the realities of, again, regeneration and election, salvation, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Think of who it was that made up the church and makes up the church. Paul says in Ephesians 2 that God has broken down a wall and two peoples who were at enmity with one another have been reconciled to be one new man, one body, the Jew and the Gentile. The Jew and the Gentile. They had no connection with one another, no relationship to one another broadly. There were individual exceptions. Broadly, there was in fact an enmity and a hatred that existed between these people. And now he says, you are the one people of God, and this is a fruit again of being adopted in Christ, who are the one new man. He says this in Ephesians 2, he himself is our peace. He is our peace. He says, you were at one time, speaking to Gentiles, separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And he has reconciled both Jew and Gentile together in one body to God through the cross, having put to death the enmity. Think about that. Jew and Gentile together giving each other a kiss of love. Outside of the gospel, you would never see that. You would never see that. 
Think about it even beyond Jew and Gentile, but all the other different kind of walks in life that come together in the church and are expressed in this affectionate sign of unity. He says in Galatians 3.28, just listen, that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. It's not saying that those realities don't exist. He is saying that all of you together, there is no distinction in the relationship that you share with Christ. Everybody comes equally and shares equally in the salvation that is in Christ as the people of God. It's a glorious picture. The people who comprise the church are a pretty unlikely group to be together. Just look at our small congregation. This little, little picture of that. We come from different walks of life, different jobs, different education, different experiences, different locations around the globe. We have different interests, different cultures, different ages, different personalities, different backgrounds. And yet outside of our common salvation in Christ, we would never relate to one another, nor even want to relate to one another. And yet in Christ, we come together as the one people of God. And those distinctions within the church are melted away. Melted away. When they see the church in the diversity, what is evident and recognized is, in fact, a unity. A singleness. A singleness. And there, then all of those distinctions goes away, and together the church, with all of its diversity, is simply realized as Christians. As Christians in Christ. That's who they are. And the church uniquely brings that about because of our union with Christ and our common salvation. So being very different, we yet share, ultimately, the closest of bonds. We share the most intimate spiritual hopes, joys, loves, discouragements, and encouragements together. Together. And again, it's because of our common salvation. And because of that salvation and our union with Christ, greater than our differences and greater than those things that would divide us, greater than those things that Satan would use to divide us, namely sin against one another even, is the unity and the salvation that we have in Christ. One commentator, uh, remarking on Paul's uh, instructions at the end of 1 Corinthians, where he gives the same instruction to greet one another uh, with a kiss of love, says this, just to bring this together. He says, There is no indication here that Paul thinks of it as anything more than a sign of greeting among people who love one another. In the context of the community's divisions at Corinth, however, the holy kiss would necessarily serve as a powerful sign of reconciliation among people who had previously been estranged. It is easy to interpret this brief imperative, greet one another with a holy kiss, as a perfunctory gesture. In other words, just something that you do, just something that's ritual, just a, a common, dutiful kind of thing. Until we try to visualize the Corinthians actually putting it into practice in a community where conflict has prevailed. Within our divided denominations, can we envision the members of opposed factions and caucuses coming together and embracing in a holy kiss? As usual, Paul's call to love is simple, radical, and embodied. Can you imagine that? The kiss of love is a sign of unity and a sign of unity that apart from all of those things that Satan would use to divide in relationships and that the world and natural factions that would arise out of the differences, all of those are put aside and symbolized in this one expression of love. There's another one and I want to mention this. To go a little quickly, more quickly than I thought, but it's this. Look at verse... 13, the end of verse 13. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Reflection here of election, reflection of adoption. It's also a reflection of this within the church, discipleship. Discipleship. Discipling kind of relationships. And we see this in his tender remarks to about Mark. He says, my son Mark. It's really such a tender display of affection. It could mean a variety of things. It could mean that John Mark came to faith under the ministry of Peter. That would be very similar to Timothy, who most likely came to faith under the ministry of Paul. Paul often refers to him as my beloved son, my child in the faith. 
It also reflects, and these, it could be one or the other, but these are together, really. But it could also reflect that, that deep discipleship kind of relationship of an older Christian mentoring a younger Christian. Sometimes rabbis would use that kind of language with uh, their disciples. It could simply mean sometimes it's used to refer merely to an older Christian to a younger Christian. Come here, my son, kind of a language. All of those are probably reflected here. It's very possible that Mark did come to faith under the ministry of the Apostle Peter. It's not for certain, but it is possible. It certainly is a reflection of this deep and close ministry relationship that he has here of one who was younger than him. It's not likely at all that this is Peter's actual son, which some have suggested. But it is, in fact, a term of endearment, of affection, and it shows the close relationship that they shared. And it's not surprising, then, when we read the book of Acts, that it is at the house of John Mark that the church met. It was at his house where the group was gathered that was praying for Peter in Acts chapter 12, verses 12 through 17, when he was put into prison and where Peter went when the angel released him. There's a closeness of ministry partnership and relationship. It's probably most evidently striking, or most striking in this, however, that Mark, this is most likely the Mark, the John Mark, I should have mentioned that earlier, that we see in Acts, but the Mark, the John Mark, who is accredited with writing the second gospel in terms of where it is in the canon. The second gospel. The gospel of this is the Mark of the Mark that bears his name in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of the gospels. This tradition is stated by one old writer who says, Mark, referring to the same person, having become the interpreter of of Peter, wrote down exact accurately whatsoever he remembered. This is quoted several times by early church fathers who identified this Mark as a close associate of the apostle Peter who wrote down for us and what is recorded to us in the second gospel what actually was, came from what he knew and what he learned from Peter himself. It's really a reflection of Peter through Mark that we see in the gospel. Now, this is possibly even supported by the fact that we have this rather strange account in Mark chapter 14, verses 51 through 52. And if you'll remember that it was in the garden when they came to arrest Jesus and take him away. And it says they all scattered. They all fled from him. And then we have this really, let's just say it, weird statement in verses 51 through 52 or account and it says a young man was following him wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body and they seized him but he pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked you think why in the world is that in scripture well it's there simply to show the chaos of the scene it's simply to show that it was a chaotic scene that was going on everybody was kind of panicking and also to show the completeness of the abandonment that Christ experienced all of them fled away even under those embarrassing circumstances but it's also interesting that that account is recorded only in the gospel of Mark which is at least an indication that it's possibly a reference to himself although there's more than 13 suggestions but that one rises to the top so Mark is a picture then of a man prone to weakness prone to failure as much as all of the disciples were at that point but under the discipleship of Peter he comes to have a wonderful place in the history of the church and even as a writer of scripture even as a writer of scripture Probably the most significant way that Mark stands as an example of discipleship, however, is in this. Is Mark is also introduced to us as one who attended with Barnabas, and Colossians 4.10 tells us that Mark actually was a cousin of Barnabas. But if you'll remember that Paul and Barnabas embarked on missionary journeys that took them around to many places to establish the church in Gentile areas, But when, in Acts tells us, 
that though Mark joined him and Barnabas in one of their missionary endeavors, that at some point, Mark couldn't handle the heat. Mark couldn't handle the cost. And he ended up abandoning them. He left them. Verse 36 of Acts 15 says, After some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city which we proclaim the Lord. Barnabas, remember the cousin, Mark's cousin, wanted to take John called Mark along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas. That's actually the Sylvanus mentioned in our passage and left being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord you really see a lot of relationship intertwined here in this little greeting don't you but here as it focuses on Mark Mark became such an issue of contention because he had left them in the work earlier that Paul says I don't want to take him with them I'm actually not going with you if you take him with you Barnabas was insistent on the fact that Mark had failed but he would still be useful to their work Paul said no and they had such a sharp argument such a sharp disagreement that they ended up splitting up their ministry endeavor and going two separate ways pretty amazing and it's not entirely clear that Paul wasn't the one most at fault here our beloved apostle but in either case somewhere along the line John Mark ended up proving himself and later in Colossians 4.10 I already mentioned it Paul calls him to be notes him as being useful in the ministry and at the very end of his life at the very end of Paul's life in 2 Timothy, he gives these tender words. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark. Pick up Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me for service. Somewhere along the way, Mark grew. Mark learned from his failures. However, I would note that Barnabas is the one who took a chance on him and took him under his wing. And no doubt, that was a pivotal moment in Mark's discipleship. If Barnabas would have left him too, who knows how he would have developed as a Christian? Who knows how he would have developed as a servant of God? But Barnabas took a chance, took him under his wings, took him near, let him have a, another shot at being a missionary and taking the gospel along. In other words, Barnabas took him in as a disciple and it helped shape him and mold him to be an important help to Silas and to the apostle Paul ultimately and to the apostle Peter as well. So Mark stands as a continuing encouragement. The fact that he's mentioned here in Peter's level letter shows the fruit of a mentoring and discipleship, the kind of change and restoration that can come from one who is not dismissed as a failure every time they drop the ball, every time they can't handle it and they do fail. But failure in the Christian's life is not the last word. And mature Christians can recognize that and come alongside, especially those they see with potential. It's an incredible, incredible lesson. In fact, it's through failure that we learn some of our greatest lessons and the Spirit does some of His greatest humbling and sanctifying work in our hearts, isn't it? It's actually through that failure that Mark became a better servant down the road as he learned from it and as he grew. And Peter particularly, it's a sweet picture here, would have had a soft spot, spot in his heart for Mark because Peter certainly knew the bitterness of personal failure, didn't he? He knew what it was like to crumble under pressure. He knew what it was like to commit a sin and to fail in a way that he never dreamed possible. But he also knew what it was like to receive grace and forgiveness and restoration and ultimate usefulness to the Lord. Peter being restored by the Lord himself. And so you can imagine he would have had a particular soft spot to do the same, even to someone like Mark. And in fact, Mark himself then stands here as a wonderful example of Peter fulfilling Jesus' own words to him in Luke chapter 22 through 32. After he told him that you, Peter, are going to fail, he said these words, but once you have turned again, do you remember the rest? Strengthen your brothers. 
strengthen your brothers. You're going to fail, Peter, but that failure is going to shape you. And out of that shaping experience that comes through your failure, you're to take others and strengthen them and disciple them. Not from a place of arrogance where you started, but from a place of humility, which is where you ended up and which actually makes you more useful. So this is a great lesson to us. It's a lesson to us and parents and how we view the failures of our children. It's a lesson to us as the church and how we treat one another in times of failure and weakness. We are to have the attitude, as Paul said to the Galatians, to bear up one another's burdens. Let's just note one very, very briefly, last part here, and that is the doctrine of the church. Uh, go back to she who is in Babylon. She who is in Babylon. Now there is, you can imagine, a lot of discussion on what exactly does this mean. It could be understood literally or it could be understood figuratively. She has been, it's been suggested that this is Peter's wife. They even say that she who is chosen is actually a proper name for his wife, naming his wife, but that's not very likely for a variety of reasons. But that is at least out there. It could be a significant female figure in the church or figuratively the church itself. The same with Babylon. It could be an actual location or it could be a figurative expression. She is almost certainly a reference to the church. It's a common way. Matter of fact, John himself, I won't go there, uses these feminine kind of pronouns to refer to the church. We see that in life sometimes, people refer to like their boat as she. You know, I'm going to take her out. Or their car or whatever. But theologically, the way that that's used in the church or in the context of the Christian church, it is because the church is what? The bride of Christ, right. The bride of Christ. She is a she. We are a she. We are the one who is being made ready and adorned in Christ to be presented to him as a bride at the end. So she is not as a common way to refer to the church. Babylon could be a geographical location. It could be a geographical location. There's two. The old Babylon that we usually think of is a place that largely sat in ruins at this time. There's no association with Peter's ministry there. There is a Babylon also that was along the coast or in Cairo, near Cairo in Egypt, but it was a Roman military fortress at that time, and there's not likely that Peter's writing from there. So the best way to understood this and the most common way is that this is metaphorical. It is a Babylon as a reference not to a specific geographical location, but it is an identification of the church most likely in Rome and Babylon there being an expression of the characteristic of the environment in which the church is found, namely one hostile to it. Namely one hostile to it. In Isaiah and Jeremiah, Babylon is the very epitome. It's the place of God's unique judgment and an epitome of rebellion against God. John uses Babylon, of course, in Revelation. You're familiar with chapter 17 through 19 particularly to be the heart of this apostasy and egregious rebellion against of humanity, against God under the leadership of the Antichrist. Motivated by Satan. Remember that Peter is writing to a group scattered, a group persecuted. He does give them instructions to honor those whom God sets authority over them, but it was that authority that was persecuting the church. And so this then is a reminder that we as the church, again, are not yet home. The reformers refer to it as the church militant, meaning the church on earth is engaged in a spiritual battle and a spiritual war. Peter's already made that clear. And that's where we are. But it's a reminder, too, of what we've been saved to. Jesus said, In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. And so now, in Babylon, the church is in a hostile, it's not a location, it's describing, it's not even to be some kind of secret code word. It's merely saying the church in hostile territory, but the church that has overcome in Christ and will overcome. And so he ends with these words, peace be to you all who are in Christ Jesus. And this again is the precious reminder that though now in a hostile environment we have the ultimate peace. Engaged in war we have peace with God and with one another. Jesus said these own words on his resurrection. He says in Luke 24 why they were telling these things those whom he appeared to on the road to Emmaus. He himself stood in their midst and said peace be to you. 
the same thing in John 20. It says, So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands, his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus, so Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I send you. For centuries, up to about the 13th century, I believe, a holy kiss was a part of the ritual of the Lord's table. It was what the church did to express their unity. St. Augustine, one noted, says that when Christians were about to receive communion, they demonstrated their inward peace by the outward kiss. One early father, Cyril of Jerusalem, commenting on the kiss of peace before times of prayer, said this, For the gift of peace and unfeigned love, undefiled by the hypocrisy or deceit, was a sign that our souls are mingled together and have banished all the remembrance of wrongs. Commenting on that one said, The kiss was the, was the sign that all injuries were forgotten, all wrongs forgiven, and that those who sat at the Lord's table were indeed one in the Lord. It was a sign of the peace that belongs to those who are in the kingdom of Christ. And that means then, as we come to the Lord's table, and our hearts being prepared, that we're acknowledging that we, through faith in Christ, through a life that evidences genuine repentance, a genuine desire to pursue holiness because of that relationship, that we are those who are at peace with God. When we come to the Lord's table, we are saying that we are those, as the people of God, who are pursuing peace with one another. And that means that if we come with any animosity in our hearts towards another, that we need to extend forgiveness to or receive forgiveness from that we need to deal with that before we take the elements and any sin and come to him with a pure and an undefiled heart, eager to follow him wherever he leads. Let me pray, and then the men will come forward and hand out the elements. Father, thank you for these tremendous realities of the salvation that we share in Christ. May we delight in them, rejoice in them. May they reflect, however imperfectly, and certainly we do reflect them imperfectly, because as much as we have been made new in Christ, that newness is so often hindered and marred by the remaining presence of sin. But sin isn't what defines us, our God, by your grace. Sin is what we turn from. Sin is what we confess. Sin is what we strive against. What defines us is these realities that we share in Christ, a common salvation, a common election, common spiritual realities, common hopes, common joys, and a common love for you. May our hearts be in tune with these realities even now as we take the table together. Prepare our hearts for it. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.